Greetings, this is Gus T. Renegade. Uh, we're having another episode of The Cows, uh, looking to get constructive information uh, to combat the system of racism. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to another broadcast. Uh, again, I hope the programs are constructive. Uh, if you do not think uh, these programs are sharing constructive information, uh, please invest your time and energy in something that you think will be constructive. Uh, we want to be very efficient uh, in practicing counter-racism and not doing things that are not a constructive investment of our time and energy. Uh, definitely we'll be looking to take some phone calls today. Anybody that wants to call in to uh, make comments, uh, share their thoughts, uh, the number is 347-215-5500. Uh, we'll definitely be taking some phone calls uh, close to the bottom of the hour. Um, Want to get right to it. Uh, today's guest um, wrote the book, Men in Black. Uh, this book is about the symbolism of black clothing um, and how it's evolved over time. Uh, very detailed analysis of how this has changed. Uh, and I felt this topic uh, very interesting in studying racism. Uh, to analyze uh, why white people have attached such importance uh, to wearing black robes for judges, uh, the black power business suit, uh, the whole gothic look, um, just so many different articles, particularly black leather, um, so many different uh, manifestations of uh, black clothing conveying so much power and respect uh, to contrast that with being in a system of racism. So uh, author of Men in Black, Dr. John R. Harvey, is our guest for today. Uh, Dr. Harvey, are you there? I am, yes. Outstanding. I want to, again, thank you for taking time to uh, call in and uh, share your views with our listeners. I really appreciate it, sir. Um, would you uh, tell our listeners uh, anything you'd like them to know about yourself, uh, your academic background, other books that you've written, anything you'd like to share with us? My academic background is that I teach English literature at Cambridge University uh, in England. Uh, I've also written, I've worked on the novel and on visual art. I've also written novels, and one of my novels, Coup d'etat, about Greek, the Greek dictatorship, came out in the States, but I'm afraid uh, 10 or 15 years ago now. Um, but I, I, otherwise I'm interested in visual things, and I became interested in black from my 19th century teaching, where I was talking about all sorts of other things, but often with slides, and noticed that almost always the men in the pictures were wearing black, and that led me to look into the whole question of black fashions, the fashionableness of black. Hmm, very interesting. Um, I also wanted to check, you have a PhD in English, is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay. Um, I am not very skilled at anything, and certainly not uh, in the use of the English language, but I have a great respect for words. And I really, it is, it is a privilege and an honor any time I get the opportunity to speak uh, to someone who has a doctorate in English. Um, would it be okay if I asked you just a few basic questions about language and, and the use of words before we get into your book? Please, Gus, yes. Okay. Um, I do a lot of, all of my radio shows are focused on racism, but I do uh, a lot of discussions. Uh, and in dealing with this subject matter, uh, a problem that I have observed consistently is that people do not have a high regard for words and particularly for the importance of having clear definitions attached to the words that are used especially when talking about racism. Um, just in the past week, uh, I was at a meeting, uh, it's an organiza a student organization uh, that's focused on addressing issues of racism, and someone in attendance asked, well, what's your definition for racism? And the people in the group said, well, we don't have a definition. And they did not grasp what an error that, you know, they were making and naming this group. They had the term racism in the name of the organization, but they did not have a definition for the term. 
um, as a doctorate in English or having a PhD in English, uh, could you share with our listeners just the importance of having clear definitions attached to words if you're going to have clear and effective communication? I think it's clear that words need to be used with a sense of all that all it is that they are saying. Uh, the complication, I think, is that people often want to load what they say uh, so as to bring about one purpose or another purpose. And even children will say what they feel will bring about what they want and they quite easily children i mean little children quite easily lie they don't they just think they're using the words that they uh, that will bring about what they want so i think people in a sense use language for their purposes not normally to describe things very exactly and they are able to succeed in that so it's very very important if you're not to be used by someone else uh, by the way the tricks they play with words to actually be very clear about what words mean. Wow, so you say that's, uh, would you say it's correct that one way of combating uh, individuals who might be attempting to deceive you in the way that they use words would be to ask questions about the exact meanings of the words that they use? I'm sure that's very important. It's very important to ask the question because what people will often say is, or even if they don't say it, it's what they will often mean. It'll be, I know what you're saying. You are saying, and then they say something else, which wasn't what you are saying. I think it's very important to actually say, well, no, I'm saying this. This is exactly what I'm saying. What are you saying? Uh, no, I think definitions are very important. Okay. Um, one of the trends uh, that I have noticed um, in asking people for definitions and things is often, instead of a definition, they will give a metaphor or an example. Um, and I've seen this uh, also not be constructive, um, uh, just for an example. Um, I was speaking with someone, and they used the term success. And I said, well, what do you mean when you say success? And they said, well, uh, Barack Obama, uh, he's successful. And uh, Halle Berry, she's successful. And I said, well, those are examples of people that you think are successful. I still don't really know what you mean when you say uh, success. Um, do you think that it's incorrect to substitute metaphors for definitions of words? I think the whole point of a metaphor is that it's incorrect. And I guess I should say, Gus, that being a teacher of English and quite a lot a teacher of poetry and novels and so on, I deal a great deal in metaphors. But I think the point about metaphors is that they are true and not true, uh, both together. And why they're dangerous, I think, is that very often a metaphor is a form of exaggeration. Uh, an exaggeration may move you, it may serve a purpose, but an exaggeration is not going to be true. So metaphors are very dangerous. And that's why metaphors are used a great deal in politics, both in political cartoons and political slogans. Uh, you can do a lot with metaphors, but especially you can give spin and a slur. Uh, metaphors, are, metaphors are dangerous because they're powerful, and it's the power that's interesting if you're teaching literature, but their, their power makes them dangerous, and you're quite right. One needs to be very careful with them. Hmm. How is it, uh, could you, I guess, go into a little more detail in terms of about how metaphors are used uh, in politics to, I guess, arouse emotion or do different things? Well, I deal in part with visual metaphors, but something that made uh, quite an impression on me and touching on the race issue is that the I know that the Ku Klux Klan were very interested in Hitler's ideas. And one of the images from Nazi propaganda, which they adopted, was the image of Hitler as a knight in shining white armor. And you can find both in Nazi propaganda literature and in Ku Klux Klan literature this image of uh, Hitler dressed in uh, a medieval suit of armor, which is not so much shining like aluminium, but actually white. And this seems to me, I mean, obviously the racism is implicit in the, in the whiteness of the armor. It is a metaphor. It's telling you 
that he's that he's strong, that he's white, that he's racially pure. I suppose it's also telling you that he's ruthless and merciless, which may have been what that particular clientele wanted. But it's, um, it seems to me to exemplify the way in which a metaphor can take, as it were, a shortcut to people's prejudices and work on them dangerously. Wow. Wow. Outstanding. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm not very skilled myself at English, but uh, those are a couple things that I have noted and I really enjoy any time I get an opportunity to speak with someone who actually teaches mm -hmm. English. Uh, to ask them a few questions and to get a few pointers, um, and I, I really appreciate those uh, those responses. Um, I wanted to uh, get into your book because a lot of the issues hmm. that you just talked about are, are all over your book. Um, I guess I wanted to ask uh, number one um, to have your permission uh, to ask you questions uh, related to your book and about racism that deal with uh, all nine areas of people activity. Uh, education, entertainment, economics, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Uh, I'd be very glad. I mean, that's a very, a very well, the exciting selection. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to clarify for our uh, listeners uh, who might not be familiar with your uh, material um, and who may not have seen you. Uh, are you a white person? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, like I said, on this program, I uh, exclusively focus on issues of racism, and uh, I have concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy. Um, the definition that I use for racism, white supremacy, is a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they say is not white. Uh, would you say that is an accurate uh, definition uh, for the system of racism, white supremacy, and do you feel that such a system does exist? Uh, I'm sure it's an accurate definition of racism, and whether everyone is all the time preoccupied with doing that is another question, but the prejudices are very strong and deep-rooted and they go back through hundreds of years and they're built into the language that people use and this certainly applies also to the color black. Hmm. Okay. I wanted to uh, make sure I understood you correctly. You said you felt the definition was correct. Um, you said you were not sure that every a uh, white person is engaged in this at all time. Uh, I'm not saying every white person is engaged in this system. Uh, what I'm saying is that I believe that there is a system of white supremacy where the individuals who classify themselves as white who participate in this system maintain a power structure that dominates all of the non-white people uh, on the planet. Uh, do, you, do you feel that such a system uh, exists? I would have thought that the world does work in that way. Of course, if you look at America right now and the, the, the new and I think wonderful presidency of President Obama, who must have been elected by an electorate, the majority of whom were white voters, I, I suppose, um, it clearly works in, a, in an indirect and complicated way sometimes. But... Uh, I think when, when I, I mean the phrase I pick up on what you said is that you said anyone who classifies themselves as white, and I think that's a very good way of homing in on the most important people that you're concerned with. I suppose I wouldn't it wouldn't occur to me to call myself to name myself by a colour in that way. I don't think of my I don't think about whiteness. I don't think of myself as as white. Uh, but I think any people who think of themselves especially as white uh, are thinking in terms of what they see as the advantages the power the privileges of whiteness to the exclusion of others yes wow so i just i want to want to clarify for our listeners what you just said you said do you think consciously or subconsciously any person who classifies themselves as white is identifying with 
uh, the benefits, privileges that white people receive, receive as a result of the mis- systematic and global mistreatment of non-white people. Would that be correct? Uh, I would say so. Yes, the people who classify themselves as white uh, are celebrating advantages. They would identify whiteness with advantage. I can't see them identifying themselves with disadvantage. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. Um, Let's go right to the book then. Um, Could you, I guess for the listeners who are not familiar with your work, could you uh, give them a little, uh, just kind of an overview of Men in Black and what they'll find if they decide to pick it up and read your work? I think what interested me in the history of black was the way in which this color, which has on the one hand been uh, dramatic and glamorous and smart at various periods, but on the other hand, and in Africa as well as in the rest of the world, has been associated with bad omens and black and bad magic and so forth. This color, which originally in clothing was the color worn at funerals uh, and for grieving situations, situations of death and also situations of shame, the way in which this color with very negative associations slowly over the centuries came to be worn by more and more people, uh, especially men, until you get to about 1900, but that through from about the 15th, 16th century on, you find black starts to be worn by kings, by merchants, by knights, by pre, well, been worn by priests for a long time, by professional people, by doctors, uh, by people in authority, by people in service, and the use just increases and increases with fluctuations till around 1900. Around 1900, men sidestep into out of black into deep charcoals, greys, navy blues, deep browns. And the color black, I think, since 1900 has been used much more interestingly by women. Uh, In, for instance, the little black dress, which was something men never came up with in hundreds of years, but also in smart black outfits, dashing black outfits, glamorous black outfits. And into the the present years, I think the the color black in dress has been has been used uh, well most strikingly and successfully to pick up on your earlier word uh, by women. But what had interested me was the way this color of uh, shame and death and bad omen, uh, as it was worn in dress, slowly became the color of authority, rather oppressive authority, power. Um, dignity, probity, money as well, of, as as you were perhaps touching on, white men. I mean, it was the white men who wore the black as they exercised their, uh, if you like, racist authority uh, throughout the world, as they conquered the world, took charge, and in a way used a quite severe version of Christianity and black having been a Christian color to help them do that. I mean, those are some of the things that interested me. But on the other hand, uh, black from the 16th century on becomes also a color worn by smart young people. And I think it's when black is worn by smart young people that it especially starts to be a sexy color. And so you get dashing and smart and sexy young black wear uh, through several centuries. And again, in recent, in the recent hundred years or so, there have been lots of youth fashions which have been black and exciting and dashing and sexy and glamorous. Wow. Uh, Very interesting. Uh, Very interesting. Um, This is Dr. John R. Harvey, uh, author of Men in Black on the Cows. Um, I became aware of your book um, in one of the lectures of Dr. Francis Cress Welding. Uh, Are you familiar with that person? I'm afraid I'm not, no. Oh. Okay. Um, Dr. Welsing, she is a non-white female. Uh, She's here uh, in the States, and she has a book titled The ISIS Papers, and 
the basis of her book is, and again, it would probably be best to check it out uh, yourself if you're interested, because I might, I'm certainly, I'm not going to do her justice in uh, restating her theory. Uh, but the premise of her book is that uh, the white people who practice white supremacy are motivated to do so because white people are a small percentage of the global population, and if white people began having sexual intercourse with non-white people uh, to a great degree, uh, you would end up, the offspring would end up like President Obama, he's classified as a non-white person, uh, that if enough white people were having sexual intercourse with non-white people, uh, the offspring would be darker skinned and would not be classified as white. Uh, she titles this uh, fear of white genetic annihilation uh, because the white phenotype is genetic recessive. Um, it's her theory that this is what is motivating, consciously and or subconsciously, this is what is motivating white people to practice racism, white supremacy. Um, I guess, how do you feel about that theory, and as I said, that's how I found out about your book. She was speaking about your book and the symbolism of black clothing and saying she thinks that could be, that could suggest um, white people are wearing black um, directly and or indirectly uh, because of that sense of genetic uh, inferiority, um, wearing the black clothing uh, as a sense to cover up the white skin. Um, just if, if you understood that, if you could uh, share your thoughts on what you feel about her theory and the fact that that's how I found out about your work. It sounds a very interesting book, and I didn't uh, – I was able to jot down the title of the book, The ISIS Papers, so I'll be able to Google that and, and get to the book and, and read the whole, the whole case she makes. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent the – I think the people who – I mean, black – has become in increasingly uh, glamorous, I would have thought, and exciting, having for a long time been being associated with um, sexual sexual power and attraction. Uh, I suppose what has struck me in, in living in England is how much things have changed in in my lifetime. I'm in my sixties, and I think the <clears throat> when I was a kid the racism was quite extreme and in from the mouths of relatives and so on I would certainly hear it and things have actually changed very much so that uh, you see mixed race couples um, very naturally and comfortably around so I don't think the old kind of taboos and fear, fears that there were are very operative uh, in England now, which, as you'll know, has a very large population of, of, of African ancestry, um, some directly from Africa and many also from the sometime British colonies and possessions around the world and so on. Um, whether the, the black fashion, what relation the black fashion uh, bears to... Uh, the recessive genes and the black skin, uh, I, 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 I suppose I would be speculating very much if I said too much about it. I think the original motivation for wearing black was the uh, association with death and sin and grief in a church which was founded on the death of a particular holy person, Jesus Christ. This was why the general mourning color of black became the color of large sections of the black church, of the Christian church. Uh, and that then spread to, slowly spread to the rest of society and slowly became more, uh, more worldly. What is true is that the black fashion develops in Europe at the same time that the explorations are uncovering more of the world, and you could say are uncovering more of the different races of the world and encountering um, 
people of people of various colors of skin. Uh, another interesting point is that the black fashion, which is very dominant in the 16th and 17th centuries, recedes during the 18th century, which is the high point of the slave trade. Uh, and then as the slave trade is slowly cut back in the 19th century, the black fashion returns in dress. Perhaps the two things are unrelated, but it is it is rather curious that it works in that way. Hmm. Very interesting. I wanted to highlight, um, just to make sure that I understood you correctly, um, did you say that black fashion uh, evolved and expanded among white people uh, as white people came into contact with more non-white people uh, throughout the world. Is that correct? Well, those two things were happening at the same time, certainly. The, it was as the, Europeans, as the Europeans were expanding throughout the world, that was the time when they were encountering more, more different racial groups. And this was also the time when the black fashion um, was expanding in Europe. But, but certainly those things were happening at the same time. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, get you to share your views. Um, you said a little bit earlier that uh, black has an association with uh, being sexually attractive and a, and a, a sexual potency. Um, you started your book uh, with a quote from uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh, one of his films, I believe, Reservoir Dogs. Um, in another Quentin Tarantino film, Pulp Fiction, um, there is a scene uh, where a white man uh, sodomizes a black male, and there is another white man in all leather, all black leather, uh, from head to toe. His, his head is even covered in uh, black leather. Um, could you talk about this? I don't know if you've seen Pulp Fiction, but... Uh, yes, I have. Yes, I liked it very oh, much, okay. yes. Okay, okay. Um, if, if you're aware of the scene that I'm talking about, I guess did you share your thoughts on uh, the the symbolism of the black leather in that scene of, uh, I guess that would be an S&M scene, a scene of uh, sadomasochism? Uh, sure. I think uh, black has certainly been used in clothes as a, a, a frightening color, as a frightener, partly picking up on the associations of uh, black with the grave, of black with death, black with grief. Um, but also, I suppose, if one thinks of fear as a, as a dark thing, uh, I think in the Christian church, the first people to wear black were monks who stayed in their monasteries. They weren't trying to frighten people. They were, be, they were grieving. But then the Dominican friars, the black friars, uh, went out through the world evangelizing but also persecuting and burning heretics and became one of the orders that staffed the Inquisition. And I think they were aware of their, uh, that their black was frightening. In Russia, Ivan the Terrible had a kind of secret police which would go around uh, attacking, killing uh, aristocrats who disagreed with the Tsar and other people too. The, they were called the Oprichniki, the men apart, he made them dress in black because it was more terrifying, and he said so. And Himmler, in the Nazi, in founding the Nazi SS, again made them dress in black because it was uh, frightening, terrifying. He uh, he said that. So uh, it, it is a colour of fear and power and cruelty when worn in a certain way. So it's not surprising that sadists and masochists pick up on that. And I suppose if you want to make, if you want to be, if you're inflicting cruelty on another person with sexual excitement, black, then especially if it's black leather with associations of violence, and I guess black leather coats may have come in again uh, with, the, with the Third Reich, um, it's not surprising if sadists wear uh, black, like to wear black leather when they're pursuing a kind of sexual cruelty, or if masochists again, are especially turned on or excited if the person who they want to persecute them deliciously is, is wearing black leather. And, of course, all of that is an utterly different dimension from the actual experience 
of coloured people when they are victims of various forms of oppression, including sexual oppression. Uh, I found uh, in your book uh, when you spoke about black leather, um, I'm, I'm reading from page uh, 245, um, hmm. you were talking about black, re- black leather and you said it is raw, a way of wearing on top of your clothes what is normally underneath skin, except that it is not so much skin as hide, but then it is stripped hide, hairless, naked. Also, it is dead hide, the more dead or deadly because stained black. Uh, this nakedness with deadness together with its, with its animal associations allows it to transmit its meaning intensely, which can be sinister and violent. Uh, and if black leather was for a time a police uniform, uh, it has also become the standard youth uniform, uh, a means of putting on toughness in readiness to hit the street. Um, Just from that passage and other places in your book, it again um, made me think of white genetic annihilation and a sense of putting on a toughness, putting on black skin, as it were, uh, with black leather. Um, Do you you think that's that's a logical connection to make there? I think it must be. It's a. It's. It's. I hadn't. I had my own thought. Hadn't quite gone as far as that. But I think you're right, Gus. I think that's a. That's a good connection to make. And I think the putting on of black for strength um, goes back quite a long way. That knights in armour in the Middle Ages. You see suits of armour in museums now, and they look like aluminium or something. They're all sort of polished, shining, silvery metal. But they were actually metal rusts, of course, and especially if you're going around battlefields. So very often the armor was painted, and very often it was painted black, uh, with a sort of black black lacquer. I mean, in a way, the knights in armor were a sort of early version of, I don't know, black Ford cars or something. The men were uh, striding around the battlefields in painted armor, which was very often black armor, and that must have both been frightening to the other side and also perhaps help them to feel stronger. Wow. Wow. Wow, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, Again, uh, in in your book, um, just to touch on the sexual thing, um, on uh, on page 36 of your book, and in in other spots as well, I just noted, Hmm. page 36, um, you said that, uh, and we've talked about it to some degree in this conversation, that uh, there is a, a sexual potency to black. Um, frequently, um, people talk uh, in dichotomous terms of black and white. Uh, if black uh, has been endowed, if white people feel that uh, the color black and black leather has this sexual power, uh, implicitly, are they saying that there is something not sexual about white? Uh, I do want to come on to the black, but about white, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, what, it's easy for white, uh, a white, a very white, white person to look unhealthy because they are so white. And if they are, if they are really white, then there's probably something genetically wrong, of course. And actually, these color terms are precisely what you mentioned earlier, metaphors, I think. Eyes are not blue, hair is not red. White people are not white. Black people are often not not black. But as to what the sexiness of white, uh, in a way you're right. But if you think of a fairy tale like Snow White, why Snow White is so beautiful that the wicked queen, uh, even her own mirror, tells her that she's not as beautiful as Snow White. Why Snow White is so beautiful is because her skin is as white as snow, her lips are as red as blood, and her hair is as black as ebony. And there, clearly, both the white is sexy and, and the black is sexy. But about sexy black, I think one point to make is that it wasn't invented by people, uh, that it was invented by the animal kingdom, that real glossy or lustrous jet black uh, is something which comes into existence, well, in our universe anyway, 
uh, really with animals that, uh, and, I mean, maybe outer space is black, but uh, minerals, elements, uh, normally not black, things which are black, jet black or glossy black, like uh, uh, onyx or the stone jet or coal, of course. They're normally organic compounds. They're basically vegetable matter that has over hundreds of years become hard and black. The real jet black really is something which the animal kingdom developed. Uh, one thinks of black panthers or blackbirds, I suppose, but other animals like penguins, various beetles, all sorts of animals have uh, an intense black color, either entirely or over part of them. And it does seem that this has developed especially through sexual selection. And that was what Darwin thought in his first book, which was about natural selection, simply the strongest person survives. His second, not his second book, but I mean another famous book of his, The Descent of Man, is about the effect of uh, sexual selection on uh, creatures and the look of creatures. And this, inclu this includes observing that in various creatures the intense glossy blackness of often the males, but not always the males, does seem to have developed from a kind of original brown colour through sexual selection. So I think it's that, that sort of sexy black in that way is something which precedes the development of human beings. That it's not surprising if it, it arises with human beings too. And just one other thing to say, uh, Gus, if I may, is that I think people who've gone inside the eye and the way the eye works find that there are two sorts of cell inside the eye. The one is called the cones, which seems sees colours like red, green and blue. The other is, are called the rods, which basically see light and dark. And people used to assume that the rods uh, responded to light and sent their electrical discharge back to the brain whenever they saw uh, something bright. But actually, it does now seem that what the rods respond to is darkness and black. It's when the rods in the retina of the eye see something which is very uh, dark or jet black. That's especially when they send their electrical discharge back to the brain. So this means that although black is in a sense of no color, it's also a very intense color and one which we really, the eye jumps to and which we notice easily and quickly and in a way positively. And so I think it's no surprise if, it's, uh, if it also works strongly as a, a sexy colour in, in, in clothes as in skin. Fascinating. Fascinating. Again, this is uh, Dr. John R. Harvey, author of Men in Black, uh, The Cows, uh, Gus T. Renegade. Um, uh, and again, I want to make sure I let the folks who are listening in know uh, you can call in 347 Two one five six zero seven one. I will be uh, checking out the phone lines in a little bit. Um, your book, uh, interestingly, uh, Men in Black, uh, and you uh, made a point of saying that you you focused on white men uh, wearing black clothing. Um, again, metaphors uh, and really trying to pay close attention to words and phrases. Um, Dr. Welsing points this out consistently uh, in her talks um, that, you know, it is a popular phrase um, that white people say, uh, white females say that their desirable mate would be tall, dark, and handsome. Um, it is also uh, said frequently that uh, clothes make the man. Um, just from what you touched on earlier about uh, using black clothing to convey a sense of, of authority and uh, glamour and, and power in different senses, um, it seems to suggest that, particularly with white men, black clothing uh, is, I would say, almost necessary uh, to convey a certain sense of masculinity. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, judges' robes, priests, uh, the, the black business suit, um, does that seem like a logical connection to make uh, based on the material uh, in your book and what you just observed? It, the, yes, it has, come, it has come to be like that. Um, I mean, the world wasn't like that. If you go back to ancient times or ancient Greece or ancient Rome, 
um, <clears throat> they had, I mean, they wore black at funerals, and they also had smart black in their home decorations, that they had black pottery, they had the walls of their houses, their villas would have black panels, glossy black panels painted on them, and then the flowers or birds would be picked out in colour on that. But they didn't wear black clothes, except at funerals. Uh, they wore light-coloured clothes, bright clothes. But, however, the world has slowly changed, and black has picked up this tremendous charge, which includes, for men, uh, the male sexiness and male authority and male glamour, Though, as I say, I think in the last hundred years or so, women have especially worn black most dramatically. Mm. I think tall, dark and handsome uh, means, on the one hand, it's like Snow White's hair, which is ebony. And that's, that's part of her beautiful, it, her, that her hair is jet black. That's why Snow White is so beautiful. She's not a Barbie. Um, but tall, dark and handsome for white men, I think, refers partly not only to dark clothes but to black hair and or very very black hair as far as the men are concerned the other point about men i think is that whereas it was uh, in the white races it was really the, the women who were white i mean the women were kept indoors all the time they didn't let the sun touch their skin if they went out they had parasols and other ways of um, protecting themselves from the sun and they aimed to have a terribly white skin, but men didn't do that. Maybe the aristocrats tried to preserve a fairly white skin, but most men, I think, rode around or walked and ran around exposed to the sun and would have, would have been fairly dark and swarthy. So the, the tall, dark and handsome man, he might be wearing dark or black clothes. He'd probably have black hair. He'd probably have a fairly, a fairly swarthy complexion as well. I uh, wanted to, to point out as well with the tall, dark, and handsome, um, as Dr. Welsing mentions this uh, fairly consistency, um, the fascination that many white people have with tanning. Um, and I guess I would ask, do you see an association uh, between tanning and uh, white people tanning to darken their skin uh, and this tall, dark, and handsome and this association with black being a sexy thing, getting a tan, uh, being, I mean, I, I feel like I've heard a lot of white people associate uh, having a nice tan with being a sexier attribute for white people. Um, how, what's your view on that? I'm, sh well, I've, I've tanned myself and I've hoped I was improving. Uh, my, my wife is Greek and we spend our summers in Greece and I've certainly, we, we both have, but I've certainly and sort of laying in the sun in hopes of being browner than I, browner than I naturally am in England, as it were, and I've thought of that as, a, as an improvement. Uh, I think people have thought until I started to get worried about skin cancer and so on. I think people have, uh, yes, have have sought a darker skin uh, in the last <clears throat> well, six to seventy years in a way that earlier they they didn't i think people tried to keep themselves partly because of course people were not uh were not so clean in earlier times so they would have not been for various reasons they would not have been white they didn't wash so often and so on um but i think the the idea of exposing yourself to the sun in all in order to get a a, a darker skin has come in in the last hundred years especially um and has gone with um a general, well, a general association of sexiness with with uh, with darker things and darker skin. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, actually, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it it definitely uh, is related. Um, you touch on it in your book, um, specifically on page uh, 102, but um, a white person, actually an admitted uh, racist white supremacist, uh, David Allen. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Washington. Um, he said that we speak the language of white supremacy. Um, you touch on that in your book. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if you believe that is a correct statement to say that, that we speak the language of white supremacy, and if you do believe that that is true, 
if you could, uh, I guess, share your thoughts uh, and evidence as to that would suggest that that is a true statement. Uh, but the 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 only thing is, Gus, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, the, the English language, for instance, is used by white supremacists, but not only by white supremacists. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, there I'd ask for your definition, as it were, of what what sorts of language you're you're meaning, or what sorts of language he's meaning. There is a whole prejudicial language of white supremacy, which uh, certainly was very common throughout Europe, which meant that people would um, just automatically think of, of uh, the devil as black and so on. But that language has diminished to quite an extent. Uh, there are white supremacists who use a, a vicious language and vicious metaphors, but I, I think I'd have to ask for a bit more definition about what what bits of language you're, you're most thinking of. Um, the discussion I had with uh, Mr. Allen, um, number one, he was specifically talking about English, um, and he was saying that the way words are used, definitions that are attached to certain words, um, the implications that certain words have, all works to support the system of white supremacy, whether it be uh, phrases like, it was a dark day, uh, a dark horse, a white lie, um, black market, different phrases like mm. that, um, more yes. overt things and more uh, implicit things that the entire language, uh, and, you know, we were speaking specifically about English, but I know uh, I'm not able to speak French, but I know some of the French uh, phrases and things, and I know uh, bet noir means black beast in yes. French, and that is uh, a pet peeve. So I would say I see evidence that this could be in a lot of other languages other than the language known as English. But that's specifically what we were talking about. Does that uh, does that add clarification? And yes, I'm, and I'm sure that the, the 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 use of the word black carries all sorts of uh, derogatory implications, if you like, of which assume a, a white supremacy. That and this is built into all sorts of traditional expressions and metaphors. Um, all of the language isn't like that and uh, I'm just thinking that the English language has spread over the world so that uh, the English language is now the language that uh, I suppose is most widely spoken in the Indian subcontinent partly because otherwise there are various other languages there but I don't I don't know that one would say that the English that is spoken both in Pakistan and in India is the English of white supremacy, though they probably have got all these metaphors with the word black in them, uh, which may be still current and may still be a bit keeping going, the old derogatory associations of the word black. But I don't think you could say that the English language in India is the language of white supremacy. It was the language of white supremacy. It was the language of the English when the English were uh, grinding, grinding the... Uh, the Indians down, but the English have gone, but the language has stayed, and I don't think you could simply say now that the English language of India is the language of white supremacy. Hmm. Hmm. You uh, please correct me if I'm if I'm uh, misquoting you. You said you feel that uh, this uh, embed the uh, subtle nature of white supremacy being present in the language, uh, the language being structured uh, to support white supremacy, you said you feel that that is um, diminishing? Is that correct? Well, I think it must have diminished in, in those countries where, <clears throat> where, which, where, where the language may be there because the English were there or, or, or the Americans. But, the, but now the English have gone where the language has stayed in use, its character must have changed. Don't you think, Gus? Uh, I mean, there are various African countries where the English language has stayed stayed current, um, but it can't still have quite the white supremacist character that it did have. I mean, if you go to a country with a very vicious history of 
uh, well, the most vicious, uh, cruel, uh, uh, systematic practice of white supremacist doctrine. I'm thinking of South Africa, where the um, the Boers, the Dutch, uh, and but who, who, however, spoke a lot of English, have um, lost their majority and lost a lot of their power. But a lot of South African politics is still conducted in the English language. Um, and Nelson Mandela very frequently using the English language and so on. I can't think that the use of uh, the English language in South Africa or Kenya, uh, let alone uh, India, would still have the same sort of white supremacist uh, slant to almost everything that it did have 150 years ago. Hmm. Um, well, now I have not been uh, to the area of the world known as South Africa, so uh, I you know, haven't really been there to hear the way people talk and to just kind of listen to the way that words are used. Um, I do know people uh, who are from all over the area of the world known as Africa. I know mm. people who are from uh, Pakistan, and they're non-white people, and I see or I hear them say a lot of things that, I would say this is evidence of the influence and the impact of racism, white supremacy, um, just in general behavior in terms of non-white people uh, saying that uh, they do not want to marry someone who has a darker complexion because they'll have darker children, so their children will be less attractive. Um, people saying that they don't want to, non-white people saying that they do not want to uh, spend a lot of time in the sun because they don't want to be darker. Um, people saying things like uh, the black market, which uh, implies that uh, you have got this uh, from some illegal means, um, and mm. it, it implies that the, the proper market would be the white market. Um, I still hear people say things yes. like that, and they they never stop to think, uh, wait a minute, what – what implications does that have for me as a non-white person, particularly if I'm a black person? What implications does that have uh, for me and on my life? And, and what am I saying about, you know, black people? What am I saying about white people? I just, I don't even hear, really hear people think about that. So I would have to say I, I still think it's there. I very much uh, see a, a huge impact, uh, a huge presence of white supremacy in the way words are used, the way words are defined the way people speak, uh, and mostly it's it's not even on a conscious level. When I point these types of yes. things out to people most of the time, they are totally baffled. You're absolutely right, of course, Gus. And I guess one could say that words, I mean, w w almost words are prejudices. That it's awfully hard to, uh, you have to use a language to speak to other people, otherwise they don't, you know, people don't understand each other, but languages... Uh, develop very, very, very slowly, and they are they, they are expressions of feeling and prejudice. And in a sense, words are prejudices. So the language, I, you could say, I'm sure that any language is is just thick with layers of new and old prejudice. And this would certainly include racial prejudice. Uh, and you could certainly also find racial prejudice in uh, in those countries, and I certainly know that uh, you can find it in India that the concern of Indians, not necessarily influenced by English people, the concern of uh, upper caste Indians not to have the kind of very dark skin which they associate with lower caste Indians, I think is something which was present in the Indian subcontinent before ever the English got there, then the English language has probably lent itself rather easily to articulating those prejudices. The world, uh, the world is full of prejudice and full of racial prejudice. I, I do agree. Hmm. Wow. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, as, as an English, uh, as, a, as a doctorate, with a doctorate in English, uh, do you have suggestions on ways people can combat and uh, work against the way uh, language is used to support racism, white supremacy? Do you have some suggestions on how uh, things people could do that would work against that and, and try to root that uh, level of white supremacy out of the way language is used? 
I don't think you can do it. I mean, uh, hopefully with education and so on, people would want to do it less. But I think the most important thing is, as you were saying, you <clears throat> ask people to define things, to say exactly what they mean. I'd have thought it's terribly important to catch those phrases, blacklisting, uh, dark horses, whatever it may be, to catch those phrases when you hear them and just perhaps make a little point about them or find some way of turning them around, changing it. Uh, I'd have thought it's, it has to be done on a local level. And that, um, but however, the more, the more people do that, the more, the more alert and awake people are to the prejudices, the prejudices which are popping out of their own mouths as they speak without their even thinking, as you say, the more people sort of wake up to what is coming out of their mouths and the more this is just picked up quietly, likely by something the other person says, uh, the more things may slowly change. Well, it will be a very slow change, I should think. I want, I want to uh, restate uh, for our listeners just to make sure and to make sure that I'm myself clear you think it would be constructive, uh, number one, if people were just more attentive to language and the way language and words are used, uh, and when anyone says some of these phrases uh, or words that are used to support uh, racism, white supremacy, to uh, call attention to that, to make yes. everyone aware yes. that that, okay. Uh, yes, Shannon. absolutely. Yes. Um, one of, uh, I think, one of the... Uh, books that is most symbolic of racism, white supremacy, uh, Conrad's, Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. Um, and before I even get to the book, because you, you talk about a lot of literature uh, in, mm. in black as well, um, before I even get to the book, there is a uh, professor, major university, uh, she uses Heart of Darkness in her class. Uh, she is a white woman, and she wears black every day um, and some of the students I should give them your book and tell them to check it out um, the students noticed that and they said we're reading this book Heart of Darkness which you know I think most people would say is, is pretty racist uh, we're reading this book and she's wearing black every day uh, do you have a thought uh, I know I mean you haven't seen this person you don't know this person but do you have a thought uh, about a, a white person teaching Heart of Darkness and wearing black every day? Well, there's a, <clears throat> there's a nice irony there. She's probably wearing black because it's professional and it's smart because of all the values that it acquired in its use by men. Uh, she's probably wearing it to pick up on those. She may also be wearing it because it's uh, a slimming color. You look slimmer in black. Um, she may, if she has jewellery, she may be wearing it to set off the jewellery. But, however, the the effect is, as you say, well, it's ironic, as you as you say, Gus. I mean, it's, it's, it would be very nice if one of her students pointed that out or asked her for her thoughts about it. I, I'm curious myself to ask, um, and particularly uh, this professor in teaching uh, Heart of White, uh, Heart of Darkness, excuse me, um, mm. She made a point of saying she did not want any students to write essays or papers on the heart of darkness and doing uh, any sort of symbolic comparison to black and white. And I heard that, and I said, my gosh, I don't know if you can talk about the heart of darkness uh, in a correct manner if you don't point out the uh, overwhelming symbolism of black, black and white uh, in that book. Um, do you think that's correct, or do you think it's possible to talk about uh, the heart of darkness in a, in a correct manner without talking about the racism that's in it and, and the symbolism of black and white? I mean, I like Conrad as an author, but that, that book, that story, he is a, has a very deep-rooted racism in it, and that must have been in Conrad too, and he's the idea that the most primitive and horrifying things could be found in tribal life in Africa uh, it's, it's, there's a very intense element of racial racial prejudice there clearly I mean other parts of the, the book when he's describing the futility of the French warship 
firing shells into the African jungle uh, with no idea where they're landing and so on. And it's in a way sort of surreal and meaningless. It's a, it's a wonderful description and very good on the sort of vanity and futility of colonialism. But at the heart of it, when you get to Kurtz and the way in which he is supposed to have been corrupted and sort of rotted at the core by his involvement in the tribal life of the, the local village, then it's, there's a very profound racism in that, clearly. Would you say it's correct, uh, the heart of darkness, the, the way that the non-white people, specifically the black people in Africa, the way that he talks about these people, do you, would you say it's correct to say that they are presented as not human? Well, you don't you don't really meet the Africans, do you? No one actually, you 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 never get to know an individual. Uh, so they are presented in a rather sketchy, a rather sketchy way. But I'm sure there is an element of racial prejudice in Conrad. What I'm thinking of is a, another novel of his, which is very famous and which I like very much, called Nostromo is about Latin America. Um, and the, there's a mixed population in this country he calls Costa Guana. Um, and there, there, there must be a black component, but there's also a Spanish component and a Native American Indian component. And I think it's clear from the way people are described that um, there's something a bit funny, a bit vulgar, not just not quite so good about the people who have an element of Indian blood or even possibly Spanish blood um, in in Costa Guana. I mean, I, I admire Conrad for all sorts of things, but he was a person of his time, and in his time, the racial prejudices were very widespread and strong, and intelligent as he was, he's not free of them, and they certainly show in his writing. Um, I wanted to wanted to make sure, just uh, to be clear, um, would, would you say it's correct uh, or incorrect to say that in particularly heart of whiteness, um, that the black people specifically, that they are dehumanized uh, in that work? I guess it would be correct. I mean, they're so sketchy that you can't say they're one thing or another, but they're certainly not presented as the sort of human beings that Europeans are. Mm. They're, they're certainly not. You Dehumanized, think, uh, you could say. I mean, there's, you, there, you see so little of them. Uh, I mean, there is a, isn't there a description in it, I'm not remembering now, of um, uh, some prisoners. Now, are some of the prisoners Africans mm. being led somewhere yes, in sir. some sort of shackles or chains? I think I'm not remembering it clearly, but I think there is a description. Now I think those people are suffering imprisonment, victims of colonialism. I think they are seen as suffering humans. It's when he gets into the heart of darkness, into the tribal communities deep in the jungle, that it becomes, I think, very sketchy. And they certainly are certainly are not full, full believable human beings there. Uh, in, in some of the discussions around this, uh, around the heart of uh, darkness, um, different individuals are saying they felt that the way white people were talked about in that book, they were uh, spoken of as though they were gods uh, in the book, particularly in contrast to the way that the uh, black people are represented. Do you think that is uh, an accurate comparison? Uh Gods, I think, is putting it too strongly, but the interesting thing is what has happened to the person the story is about, though we don't see much of him, called Kurtz, because what he's done is to go native and to involve himself in the African tribal life. And this horrifies the narrator, and I suppose was meant to horrify readers, 
but clearly he has been drawn, Kurt himself has been drawn to it, fascinated by it, wanted to do it. And the book, the story, does not, does not want, it, on the one hand it wants to present the intensity of this, of Kurt's fascination with tribal life as a very powerful thing. At the same time it doesn't want to ask why Kurtz was so fascinated by tribal life, how involved he got. So there's an uncertainty or ambiguity at the center of it. But within that, there is obviously within Kurtz and possibly somewhere in Conrad, a drive or attraction towards uh, African tribal life, which is also profoundly mistrusted. So there are some real divided feelings or divided passions there. Like that. Uh, you said uh, going native. I, I point that out as another one of those phrases uh, that I think is used uh, to describe someone who is doing something that uh, white people in a system of racism, white supremacy, are not supposed to do, particularly doing things that non-white people do. Um, I, I think I've heard that phrase used a lot, and that's that's the implication that I get from how it's used. Uh, but you, but you don't that? you think, Gus, it's an interesting phase, the phrase, because that phrase must be current because it must have happened quite a lot and it's interesting that it happened and the people to whom it was applied um, must have had quite a different take on racial values from the people who used the phrase I mean, you know, the phrase point, it's not just a phrase, it points to what a lot of people did um, which was disapproved of back in England, but the people who did it must have seen things very differently, the people who went native. Mm. Well, I mean, they, went, they, they did so because they wanted to, and they, were, they presumably were, were glad that they did. The, uh, the, film, uh, the film adaption of Part of Darkness, uh, Apocalypse Now, with uh, yes. Marlon Brando and uh, Lawrence Fishburne, yes. Yes. Um, I think that presents an example of a white person who has gone native, but at least to me, it seems that that white person is still mistreating non-white people and practicing racism. So I don't really see, a, it seems the difference is how are we going to practice racism? Am I going to go and immerse myself amongst the non-white people and practice racism, or am I going to view them as, you know, completely being abject non-humans that are beneath me and I'm doing what, you know, we white people say we're supposed to do and we're mistreating them that way. Um, I still see whether the white person has gone native or not, they're still mistreating people who are not white, um, which is... Uh, uh, I dare say that must have happened a lot. And where people are referring to um, sort of sexual transactions between white people and, say, say Africans, I know Apocalypse Now is not set in Africa, um, there may have been a lot of bad <clears throat> bad sexual politics going with bad colonial politics in in what happened, uh, certainly. I, about Apocalypse Now, that I've always found that um, a kind of inflated, rather pompous film and not really wanting to get too close to, they say, the subject which Conrad was writing about, and Marlon Brando seems to be a sort of local Napoleon or something. He seems very much a, a figure of um, authority, power, if you like, white, a sort of white, white supremacy, whatever world he's involved himself in. When you get there at the end of the river, he seems to be running it like well, as I say, he seems to me Napoleonic, like Napoleon running France in the way he sort of tries to dominate the community that he's in. Um, but also the community, uh, when you get there, they are, they're not actually very dark, are they? And they're, are, they, are they a bit albino or covered in white paint or something? I mean, I mean it struck me that it's the, the world, the, the dark world you get to at the end of Apocalypse now is is not so dark at all and is terribly unconvincing and I'm sure full of um, I don't, prejudices which probably were saleable at the time but 
it didn't. I just well, I didn't like it much, and uh, I wouldn't see it as dealing well with the uh, with situations in non-white countries. Hmm. I thought the the people uh, that Marlon Brando, well, his, the, par- the character that Marlon Brando is playing, I thought the people that he uh, was dominating, I thought they were not white. Now they certainly did that's not right, but they them. yes, he was. He was a figure of domination of them. Yes, I mean he was. He was not, he had not, I mean, the implication, I think, in Conrad is that Kurtz has involved himself sexually and in, in other ways with the, the local tribal community, but he doesn't seem to be in charge of the local tribal community. He doesn't seem to be running it, whereas Marlon Brando had somehow, whatever the forest-dwelling community was there, that Marlon Brando had somehow taken control but mm-hmm. how he took it, why they carried on doing what he wanted, uh, when he seemed himself quite an imperial figure, really, I, mm-hmm. I wasn't very clear. I, I agree. I agree completely. Um, I actually wanted to. You said you you really liked the Pulp Fiction. I that's a fascinating film. I just wanted to take a couple minutes to ask you if you could hmm. share some of your thoughts and what you enjoyed about Pulp Fiction, really quick, before I hop back to your book. Uh. I, I suppose I liked the uh, the humour of it. I liked the the irony. I liked the way it played with its story, moving back and forth. I I liked the language. Um, I liked the way one of the characters, who I think has been a hood and shooting people and so on, says at a certain point, "I'm going to walk the earth," uh, and it's picking up on, I suppose, a biblical phrase. Uh, and I just thought it was full of nice, nice, good, good touches. And it was, I think, I feel that it's a bit sad for Tarantino that he's had to resort to um, terribly extreme, violent things to really get it together to, to make another film when Pulp Fiction, that had scenes of it was about criminals and had atrocious scenes in it, actually also had a lot of light, light, good humor and surprise in it. Hmm. Wow. Um, this, the uh, Pulp Fiction is, is presented in uh, vignettes. Uh, it's like three different uh, vignettes. Did you have a favorite of the, of the scenes uh, in Pulp Fiction? Um, I suppose the scene I liked best was uh, when the a uh, young couple that have been in the diner <clears throat> preparing to stage a robbery finally get on and do their robbery and don't realize that one of the men they're trying to rob, who is an African-American, has, is actually a successful gangster and has got his gun under the table um, uh, and is in a very good situation to turn the tables on them. And I suppose I found that whole scene um dramatic and amusing and uh, uh that particular character uh, uh i suppose i like especially much in the film hmm. wow i i uh i talk about pulp fiction uh frequently um that used to be uh one of my favorite films um and i that's one of the few films that or one of the few things period that i feel able to competently uh discourse on um that film, would you say that that film uh, has a lot of elements of racism, white supremacy? You would know more. I mean, I don't... It's a long time since I saw it now, Gus, and I, you know it much better. I would have thought it's playing with those... It's aware of those things. Um, to what extent it's working in a white supremacist uh cause I don't know as I say this the person that uh, the character in it that I liked the best was this um was this an early role of Samuel Johnson or someone else I'm not sure the 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 African American uh, right. gangster sorry Jules I'm sorry his name is Jules Jules um right well I I mean I, uh, he seemed to me the person who in a way came out most attractively in the film uh and that the white characters in it are normally have awful things wrong with them of one sort and another. 
so I wouldn't say the film was, as, a, as it were, a, a white supremacist film, but it must reflect all sorts of racial prejudice uh, throughout, I guess. I know uh, the scene, the third vignette, just before they get to the diner, uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character and uh, John Travolta, before they get to the diner, um, a lot of the suspense in the in the final scene in Pulp Fiction is around disposing of Marvin. He's the black male disposing of his body uh, after John Travolta accidentally uh, blows his head off in the car, and they have yes. to to figure out a way to store, in Tarantino's words, to store a dead nigger. Um, Actually, I wanted to ask you, because you said you deal a lot with visual uh, symbolism, I have pointed out consistently to people who have watched that film, the writer and director of Pulp Fiction, Quentin Tarantino, steps into the role to say nigger about five, six times. Um, Do you think that's important to note, if we're talking about symbolism, that the director and writer of this film has now stepped onto the stage to say the lines, dead nigger storage, do you see the sign on my house that says dead nigger storage? No, because storing dead niggers ain't my business. Uh, I mean, he says it a lot. Um, what, you know, what, what is the symbolism of that? What is the meaning of the director of this film actually stepping, director and writer stepping in to say these lines? It doesn't sound too good, Gus. Uh, I agree. I mean, a, a play with, is is made with the word nigger uh, in various ways in films, and Spike Lee um, will have various characters use it in various ways. So the word has picked up all sorts of different inflections. But um, the example you're giving doesn't sound <laughs> doesn't sound too good, obviously. Uh, I mean, we're. I would even say this is we're back uh, in kind of in heart of darkness territory where we're uh, kind of being very light and funny about uh, tossing away this non-white male uh, and Wolf, uh, Winston Wolf, who comes to help them ultimately dispose of Marvin. Um, hmm. They take him to a junkyard and put him in the trunk of a car in a junkyard, and uh, he says nobody who will be missed. And they, you know, go off to the diner to have breakfast. Um, I, I mean, this is one of those where I think this is this is pretty blatant, in my opinion. And I told people, kind of thought, well, I, I don't know if that's racist. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it means anything that uh, the writer and director has now stepped onto the stage to say these lines. And especially when I point out Quentin Tarantino, he's concerned. He doesn't. The, a lot of the suspense around this scene is he does not want his non-white wife to come home and catch them doing all this. And I pointed out he's married to a black female, Bonnie, his wife, who's uh, getting home from a hard day's work. She's black. She's only on the screen for a hot second, but she is a black female. Um, do you think that add, or what does that add uh, to that whole scene, the fact that he's saying dead nigger, dead nigger, they're going to toss this, dead nigger in a junkyard and he's married to a black female well it's very interesting and I think it shows uh, how complicated things are whether you're in the States or in England um, you've got a lot of uh, contradictions existing and uh, you've certainly got intense and extremely ugly prejudices and you've also got <clears throat> mixed, mixed, mixed race relationships I think it's hard to pin, I guess it's hard to pin writers and directors down to single positions, if they're any good, because they all, they don't stay in one place. They, they'll voice horrific things one way, but then a bit later they may take it from the other angle. In a way, they, they, I mean, in a way, I think, um, it's in books and in films and anything that's in the arts which is good. You want surprise. You want the thing to be surprising all the time, not predictable, not boring. And the good or talented author or filmmaker will 
be wanting to have surprising takes and turns. So they'll say one thing in one scene, but they'll probably want to make sure they say something different in another scene. And they may be, in a way, irresponsible about some of the things they say, but not worrying about it because they'll say something else at another time. I mean, I think works of art and literature and films are ambiguous and also sometimes dangerous quantities because of that. But at the same time, you need for a work of art to be surprising. You don't want it to just tell you what you already know. Well, I, I, uh, and I, I could be incorrect. I found the uh, racism fairly consistent, uh, fairly uh, persistent, and and pretty blatant uh, throughout Pulp Fiction. Um, the fact that Tarantino's wife uh, is a black female that. There was nothing redeeming about that for me. That just made the scene uh, even more racist and white supremacist for me. Well, I think, um, but that scene is like that, Gus. I, I think you're right. I agree with you. But you also said you had liked the film very much, and it's, it is a film with, with good features as well as horrific features. I mean, it has some very horrific things in it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved the film before. This is what I tell people. Before I became aware of racism, white supremacy, before I had an understanding and before I was really paying attention to words and just trying to make sense of the things that I come in contact with on a regular basis, I loved the film. I never thought twice about uh, the scene where they say dead nigger 20 times. I never thought twice about Tarantino actually being the writer and director of this film, stepping in, and Mm. what significance Mm. does that convey? I never thought about the black male, uh, Ving Rhames, his character who is uh, anally raped by the white police officer who is also using the word nigger, I never thought, wait a minute, this looks like it could be racist. It never entered my mind. It was just, wow, this is just a fun, exciting film, and, you know, it's, it's got the discontinuity of time. I just, it was regular old entertainment for me. I never, never even thought twice, and I watched it. A lot. I watched. I've seen Pulp Fiction at least thirty times. That's why I, mm. I said this is one of the few things I feel confident talking about because I've seen this film a lot, and I've watched it even a few more times since I've become more aware of racism, white supremacy, to really pay attention to things. And uh, I'm I'm actually writing a film review of Pulp Fiction. Uh, it'll be on my blog uh, very soon. Um, but yeah, I feel uh, if if you're not aware of racism. You can watch it, and it's very entertaining. If you're aware of racism, white supremacy, you can still watch it, and it's entertaining, but the racist elements just leap out, just scene after scene after scene after scene. Um, yeah, I, I would I mean, I, I, bet you're, I bet you're right, Gus. I haven't, simply haven't seen it. I, I've only seen it, uh, I've only seen it once in the cinema, once on DVD, uh, so I, I don't know it a fraction as well as you do. Obviously, I, I, I'm sure you're right. I look out for your for your for your review. Oh wow, that would be cool. racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com. That's uh, the website racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com. I wanted to ask you a couple more uh, questions before I mm. check the phone line to see if any of the listeners yes. they want to make a comment or two. Mm. Um, in your book, you uh, talked about uh, Spain and the affinity that people in Spain, white people in Spain, had for the color black. Um, I wanted to know if and to what degree the non-white people who are classified as Moors or known as Moors and their domination of that area, if you think that had an impact on uh, the people in Spain having such an affinity for the color black. I'm embarrassed to say so, but I hadn't thought of that. But I think it's a good idea, Gus. The Moors arrived in Spain in, I think, 711. And the earliest I know about Spanish being famous for their taste, uh, their liking for black, um, liking black clothes, wanting to make their cattle black, just in generally liking black, is 12th century. So... I, it's, it is very interesting that the the European country that was really dominated for hundreds of years by the Moors is the one in which the taste for black and the black fashion 
is has for hundreds of years been the strongest as it has in Spain. I, I, it's a very interesting thought, Gus. It's, I'd have thought it does make sense. And I think you'd have had both um, the Moors themselves being dark-skinned, and I think the range of the word Moor extends from the Arab to African uh, uh, groups coming into Spain. But also, as Muslims, they would have been wearing a lot of black. So I, they, 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 they must have had, I think, a, just a considerable cultural influence. I mean, just thinking about, you know, Sousa and brass bands. Um, brass bands go back to the Turks. When the Turks invaded Europe and came up as far as nearly as Vienna, the Janissary army bands they, that they mark, with which they marched to battle played brass instruments. The European armies didn't have much to do with that, but uh, the Turks came up nearly to Vienna. They uh, were very dominant for a time, and the result is that you get onion domes on German churches, which are obviously picking up on uh, Turkish architecture, and you get brass bands all over Europe and all over the States as well, which derive really from the Turkish brass bands. So I don't think it would be at all surprising if the black elements and black clothing fashions and uh, black elements otherwise in the Moorish culture, which dominated Spain for a long time, if that left a, a large cultural trace, I think that's a very, a very good idea. Um, a different author, uh, he's actually been a guest uh, on my show before, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Uh, his theory, uh, the bullfighting in Spain that happens, um, they kill this black bull, celebrate killing this black bull, um, that chases people through the streets until they get in the Colosseum. They kill the black bull, uh, and then the bull is uh, castrated. Uh, Mr. Fuller believes that that, too, is symbolic of uh, the black people, so-called Moors, uh, their dominance in that area. Uh, and even, he didn't say this, but I, I would say, since the bull is castrated, uh, I would say this even goes back to Dr. Welsing's theory of uh, white genetic annihilation. Um, do you see any symbolism uh, with what uh, this, this cultural icon that comes from this area of the world of the slaughtering of the bull and then the animal is castrated, unless I've been misinformed. Uh, unless I've been misinformed, uh, the bull is castrated and the testicles are eaten uh, and considered a delicacy, unless I've been misinformed. Um, I don't know if you're informed about um, that practice, but if, if that is if, if that is correct, do you think uh, there could be a connection there as well? I don't know how you'd prove the connection, but if, since Spain was for a time dominated by the Moors, and then militarily um, the Moors withdrew, and there was I mean there'd be war and fighting between the Moors and the Spanish. I think it wouldn't I mean it wouldn't be surprising if that if that were an element of it. But I, I just don't know enough about bullfights or about the history to do more than have a, a sort of chance opinion about it. But it wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprising, I'd have thought. Hmm. Okay. Um, again, this is something that I do. I just uh, I enjoy being able to speak with someone who is skilled in hmm. English. Um, as I've said... I think, and you even suggested if people were more attentive to words, uh, how phrases are used, definitions. Uh, I am a fan, big fan of George Orwell. Uh, he has a lot of essays that deal with language and uh, how language can be used to uh, deceive and mistreat people. Um, I'm also a fan of Neil Postman. Do you think you could recommend any books that deal with language specifically and um, – just trying to be more precise uh, in the use of language. Do you know any books that touch on that subject matter that you could recommend? Uh, I, it's not a, a part of language that I've dis, that I've really d discussed a lot with students. I think a book on language I'd recommend, which is very different, is called. Seven Types of Ambiguity by a man called William Empson, 
what that is good at doing is showing you what very different games uh, words can play. He's not dealing with racial issues in that book, but he is showing you how slippery and complicated words are and how many different things they may be doing at the same time. And when you think they're doing one thing, they're doing another. Um, he's not saying speak speak simply because he likes ambiguity, but he certainly is very good at making you aware of what tricky, th complicated things words are and how what games they can play. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I have uh, some folks who uh, have called in. Again, call in number 347-215-6071. Uh, 281, area code 281, you are on the air. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Hmm. I didn't have any questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, Ed Williams. Didn't have any, any questions per se, just uh, called in late and I apologize for that. Uh, uh, just kind of listening to the conversation, the flow of the conversation, didn't have any questions at this time. Oh, okay. This is uh, Mr. Edward Williams. Uh, he is the uh, operator of the Counter Racism Network, um, loyally rebroadcasts uh, this program. Thank him very much for his uh, support, and thank you for calling in, sir. Um, if uh, if you want to hang on the line, I can I can leave you on, and then if you have a question or comment that you would like to uh, add in, you can feel free to hop in. Um, well, it's, it's your choice. I'll leave it up to you, sir. What would you like to do? Yes, sir. That'll be fine. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll I'd also on. be sorry. Oh, yes, thank you, Dr. Harvey. Um, I will uh, I will leave him on the line then, Mr. Williams. Um, anybody else, uh, since we have folks listening in and people uh, participating in the chat room, if you would like to give us a jingle, it's 347-215-6071. Um, let me see, I'm tracking back. Uh, Yeah, I would. I uh, very much um, appreciated being able to uh, read uh, your work and appreciate the uh, historical perspective in terms of you talked about the changes um, in how black has been represented. I found it very interesting. You talked about how black was the color of heaven originally, and that I mean that was just news to me. I've never seen heaven or anything associated with God being presented in any manner other than white. Um, can you talk about, I guess, the, the roots when heaven was represented as uh, with the color black and how that's evolved to now being almost strictly uh, Jesus and, and heaven being presented uh, in white and, and sterling, you know, the whitest of white? Yes, the I think it was the Chinese who especially thought of heaven as black, and they thought that uh, the, I mean, the stars were not black, but that heaven itself behind the stars was black. And that was why the, for I think several hundred years, the emperors of China of various dynasties would wear a black silk tunic on their upper body representing the sky and heaven. And they'd also wear yellow trousers representing uh, earth. Uh, the Christian or Western religions uh, don't think of heaven as being black, but the God, there's a whole mystical tradition of God actually li living in the deepest darkness rather than in blinding light. That there's, there's sort of paradoxes and strangenesses to God and to just look look to him as a as a bright light is not the is not the best picture, and actually one should imagine the the deepest kind of darkness and mystery as being which having somehow paradoxically its own radiance as being where God is uh, about Jesus it's true that so far as I can see the clothes which people wore in heaven in Jewish tradition which then became general Christian tradition, were white. Uh, I don't know what the Jewish religion was especially thinking of one color and another color. I think Jewish priests often wore white, 
Uh, but angels in the Bible wear white normally. Jesus, when he's transfigured, wears clothes that are shining white. And the risen Christ or Christ risen in glory seems to normally be shown as uh, wearing white clothes. But I don't think, and he's also the lamb. So they're thinking of, I suppose, white wool, because white wool was the most precious material uh, I think worn throughout the world by ancient aristocracies and in Egypt and Assyria and various ancient countries the finest garments would be of pure white wool at the same time the white is radiant and it's like wearing uh, wearing light and in a sense they're thinking not so much of white cloth as perhaps white light as being a sort of garment however Jesus wears black in some pictures uh, Jesus when he's carrying the cross in a number of medieval pictures wears black and there are some paintings where the risen Christ is wearing black Holbein, Hans Holbein did one painting like that there's also uh, <clears throat> the phenomenon really of the black Madonnas that in various European churches from about the 13th century there are black madonnas it's not that jesus himself is ever represented as a a black man in european carvings and sculptures but the madonna sometimes is and no one is clear exactly what is going on in the black madonnas but they do exist and it's also true that in uh the bible and the christian religion there are also um prominent and important uh black figures for instance uh, the queen of Sheba is uh, represented quite often uh, not just as oriental but as as uh, uh, well jet black uh, Solomon in, in the Song of Songs has the beloved say I am black but comely um, one of the magi the wise kings who came to see baby Jesus uh, is black and is often represented Balthazar is often represented as uh, younger and more beautiful and more dashing than the other Magi who normally look like elderly Europeans with long white beards. And Balthazar in the pictures of the Magi can be uh, very smartly dressed, quite often in black. Uh, and there's also St. Maurice who was a Ro the commanded a Roman legion in the 3rd century who was normally represented as a black man in medieval art. He was an Egyptian. Um, he became St. Maurice in the Christian hierarchy. So actually, the take on uh, dark colors and black within uh, Western religion and the Christian religion is more complicated than simply gentle Jesus, meek and wild in a white smock. Hmm. I'm curious about the, the black Madonna. You said there's there's uh, confusion around uh, where that came from or what that is. You mean there's yes. people, people? Yes. Um, you'll, there, you'll find there are churches in, I think, Czechoslovakia. There are just certain churches, but also 13 or 14 churches in France where the, there's a statue of the Madonna and uh, she is black. And it's people say that, uh, ah, maybe it's all the candles, the smoke from all the candles depositing. But where they've been clearly redecorated, uh, she has stayed black and the, her garments have been painted other colours. Uh, but it's, as I say, it is, it's an interesting thing and I don't, it's, it doesn't seem as though anyone has quite explained altogether what is, what is going on there. And but there are various ideas. If you... If you Google Black Madonna, you will, you will sort of get a bit... Well, there are pictures of them. Ooh, very interesting. Very interesting. I have to, uh, I have to check that out. I that, was, that was news to me. Um, wow. Um, I've heard uh, different individuals talk a symbolism of racism, white supremacy, and the fact that non-white people, many of them, have difficulty conceiving of God in any color other than white, um, do you think that represents 
the conditioning of racism and white supremacy that uh, non-white people are subjected to? Well, I'd have thought the pictures of God that people have are full of uh, political prejudice of every sort. I mean, the idea of God as uh, uh, an elderly father, the Lord of hosts, sitting on a throne to whom everyone bows down, it seems to me the sort of ideal picture of uh, what people who like kings would have liked kings to be. And I just thought the people who talk about patriarchy uh, would have a very good case at saying that making God the father was what uh, society which worships male male power would do. I just thought God... The, I mean, what if there is a God, what he or she may really be, who knows? That would be beyond my understanding, I think. But the images and pictures people make of God, I'd have thought, are, uh, express, reflect uh, all sorts of, well, beliefs and prejudices too. And giving God a skin color is a very prejudicial thing to do. And I think, if I may just add, I mean, I think where you could see in Christian theology uh, the whole question getting sensitive is the way the theologians used to discuss what will happen at the resurrection. Um, what will happen to Africans at the resurrection? Will they still be Africans? Um, and the, the Christian religion was, mm, in the later Middle Ages, was not at all clear about that. And they said, well, they must be resurrected. Um, but they may be resurrected as white men, which is a horrific idea. But the, the Christianity, is, was, when it was, as it was taken up by the Europeans, was, became a profoundly white religion in all sorts of ways. And then as it developed in Africa, of course, it's taken an entirely different character again. Wow. Wonder Cats, we have a, uh, a caller on the line. Uh... 314, you are on the air. Uh, yes, i got a question uh, for the host. Uh, and uh, you too, uh, Dr. Harvey, if you want to uh, add on. Um, since we're talking about racism, white supremacy, and movie symbolisms, uh, you were talking about uh, Pulp Fiction earlier. Um, my question to you uh, is, do you think there are any... Uh, a form of uh, any symbolisms of racism, white supremacy in the movie King Kong? The question for the host, and uh, Dr. Harvey can answer if he wants to. Uh, I will defer to Dr. Harvey. Okay. There are various uh, versions of King Kong, of course, but I suppose what is most <clears throat> striking in them is that the the giant gorilla falls so in love with a white woman um, and this does so that he, he, he worships the white woman he will preserve her uh, he's fascinated with her and I'd have thought there must be some racial subtext to or implication to that uh, but she the, in a way the drama is uh, the central, the central of attention, as it were, the focal point of the drama, is it, it was Faye Ray, wasn't it originally? But, um, but other actresses more, more recently, uh, this white woman is the kind of precious icon of the giant, uh, monstrous creature, especially associated with Africa. I don't see how you could avoid giving a racial, racial reading to that. And actually, I've got a colleague in Cambridge who spent her life uh, studying uh, monkeys and gorillas, and she was just laughing at how ridiculous it was, because any, any, any monkey or gorilla would not be at all pleased with any of these actresses, uh, because they're just utterly unlike what, what, what the monkey would want. But I think the, the, the focalizing on the white, on the little white doll, as it were, uh, which is the centre of the whole tragic story of King Kong, looks to me full of racial fantasy. Wow. Uh, actually, 
uh, Mr. Williams, uh, you're still hanging out. If you have a, a thought or two, if you would like to uh, to share uh, in response to that question, feel free. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, no, sir, I didn't. I didn't have any uh, anything at this particular time. I, you know, it's difficult when uh, when talking about um, the symbolism uh, or symbolisms of um, the system of racism, white supremacy, to attach that to. Uh, solving the race problem um it's it's something that we've done uh time and time again that non white people get involved with on a continuous basis is is uh, you know talking about and developing some appreciation for the uh the symbolisms of racism white supremacy or you know pathologies and and things of that nature so i don't uh I don't normally get involved in, in those kind of conversations, but it sounds interesting. It definitely sounds interesting, and so I am sitting, listening attentively uh, uh, to the conversation. I don't have any uh, any questions in regard to that. Thank thank you for uh, pinging me. <laughs> not a problem, sir. Um, I don't know. I uh, I have not seen. Uh, King Kong in some time. Um, I would uh, I would feel more confident if I had seen it recently to make a, uh, a statement about it. I know I uh, I heard Dick Gregory, uh, who is a non-white male, uh, he was sharing his thoughts on uh, King Kong, and he said that the fact that the uh, climax of the film, if you will, takes place in New York, he uh, King Kong is climbing the Empire State Building. Uh, he pointed out that New York uh, at the time, and may still be, regarded as uh, the boxing capital of the world, and he said that he felt it was symbolic of uh, Jack Johnson, who was a uh, boxer, non-white male, uh, famous for having sexual relationships with white women, uh, that it was symbolic of what will happen if a non-white male pursues a white woman, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. I hadn't heard that perspective before, but uh, that's what I heard Dick Gregory say. Um, again, I would feel more confident if I had seen uh, King Kong a little earlier, but uh, I'm, I'm sure, as, as Dr. Harvey said, I'm sure that there's a lot of symbolism. I know uh, white people who practice racism have refer uh, referenced uh, black people as monkeys, um, Continue. I even saw that in, in uh, President Obama's uh, campaign where he was being referenced as a monkey and uh, Michelle Obama and I believe their children as well. I've seen that happen repeatedly. So uh, it, uh, it's not surprising at all, um, and I'm sure a lot of it's there. I would just I would need to watch it again to, to uh, pick out everything that's there. Um, 314, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, I had a comment. Um, well, the reason I asked the question is because, um, you know, um, but you kind of took the words out of my mouth that, you know, this, uh, you know, back uh, back in, in history, you know, uh, we've been, uh, I'm an African-American male, and, you know, we've been uh, called monkeys and uh, sometime or another. And uh, I, I just want to say that uh, I, I looked at the movie, especially the, the, the most recent one in 2005, and, uh, you know, I think the the symbolism that I was uh, really I really looked at was that uh, when they took the monkey, uh, took King Kong out of his natural habitat and brought him to uh, a different environment, and I thought I was wanted to uh, get some uh, wanted to know what the, the Dr. Harvey thought about that. What does it have a symbolism to uh, the Middle Passage or the transatlantic slave trade? You know, taking a, uh, something out of their natural habitat and bringing them into a different environment, and the mistreatment uh, of uh, that monkey—not calling us monkeys, but when you take something out of a out of its natural habitat and bringing them in another environment, and, and the mistreatment of that—I just want to know what Dr. Uh, uh, Harvey's uh, thoughts on that. Well, I I I find that very convincing. I think it's uh, especially. I mean, the film, I think all the versions of King Kong have been made in the States and have <clears throat> played very, very, I mean, they played worldwide, but they've also played very well in the States. And I'd have thought there must be some sense of a big history behind it. 
touching on that and bringing, in a, and in a sense, the bringing, taking this enormously powerful creature, dragging him, imprisoning him, carrying him across the Atlantic, and then putting him in an utterly alien and hostile environment and killing him. Uh, must, I'd have thought, have some, be taking something from from the history. And just to go back to the sexual element for a moment, uh, I mean, the, I just thought the presentation of the tribesmen who, tribes people who worship King Kong back on uh, his own island is, uh, certainly presents them in all the versions as pretty primitive. You're not invited to feel too much in common with them. And at the same time, why King Kong has not cared half so much about any of the women on the island as he cares about Fay Ray um, or Naomi Watts in the latest version. Uh, I just thought it looks as... I mean, the film... I think the film is very in, interesting precisely because presumably in a fairly innocent way as far as the actors, scriptwriters and so on were concerned, it does reveal so blatantly... Um, a, a history of exploitation and imprisonment, transportation, abuse. All right. uh, three, one, four. Are you still there? Oh yes, I'm still here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Was there was that a question or? Oh, I, oh, no, uh, I didn't that's, know. that's all. That's all I had. I, I just wanted to know what the, what, uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Harvey's uh, thoughts were on that uh, oh. that particular part of the movie. That's all. Oh, I'll just uh, I'll just hold on and listen. Oh, okay. okay, but I think my thoughts chimed with yours. I, I thought your thoughts were very. I mean, made a lot of sense. Okay, outstanding. Um, we are uh, coming up on. Uh, end of the broadcast here, I, I again wanted to uh, thank Dr. Harvey for um, being gracious enough to uh, hang out with us and, and share your views on your book, and uh, also wanted you to make sure our listeners uh, catch where you are uh, calling uh, from today, sir. Uh, I'm calling from Cambridge, England. Okay. Definitely appreciate that. Um, very much uh, enjoyed your book and the uh, discussion. Um, if you could tell me again the book um, that you said about language that would be one you would recommend. If you could tell me the name of that book again so I can, I can look for that one. It's called The Seven Types of Ambiguity by William Empson, E-M-P-S-O-N, but another good book on the English language, both in the States and in England, is called, I think, The State of the Language, and edited by Christopher Ricks of Boston University. That's a, a recent Book, and that is also a very good book on the English language and all the varieties of uh, use and abuse that may be made of it. Can you say that last time again? Yes, I think it's called The State of the Language. It's edited by Christopher Ricks, R-I-C-K-S, who is at Boston University. Okay, I will check for both of those. Uh, we actually have hmm. one more call. I'm going to get them in. 206, uh, you are on the air. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, Dave Myers, DiscussRace.com. How are you, sir? I'm well, sir. How are you? Thank you for calling in. Well, I was able to catch this uh, towards the end of the uh, podcast. <clears throat> I had one question. Um, what if, what kind of uh, conversation would be happening if the the woman, the protagonist, uh, female protagonist, would have been would have been black? Would, in in King Kong, yes. Uh, would would people look at that and say, "Oh, this is racist"? A black woman being paired with a with a big ape. Uh, I just wonder what. Oh, you know, of course we've got the you know the the, the white flower, the proverbial uh, white flower that is held up uh, uh, and idolized uh, in our in our Western history here, uh, and of course it's problematic. Uh, in King Kong, because 
people can construe that as well uh, uh, the the black the the symbolism is that the black male worships the the white female the untouchable so if we juxtapose this and and replace the the white female with a black female i wonder what the conversation would be then what dynamic would 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 happen then i guess then people would talk much more about um male power and phallocrats and so on it would oh, become a drama of a male giant abusing abusing a woman it would lose the it would lose obviously it would lose the the racial element and become i mean a sexual political well, would it lose the racial element do you think i mean we would have a black woman then sir um and maybe people would say well can uh, w- 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 do do you think that it would lose the racial element or would that bring it more in play well it would i would lose the racial element in the sense that you were meaning of the white the, the sort of precious white flower which Naomi Watts in the last in the recent film version was um sort of very good at very good at representing uh but i suppose a more yet a more modern king kong might might very well have uh an african american woman scientist uh in the in the role of fay ray and Naomi Watts yes, and well that would uh that would have its own interest if i'm not sure what do you think that would that well, would then I, suggest I, I i think i think sir that it that it adds a, a, another twist to mm. to the conversation as in would this be a, a a sign of 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 disrespect for african and american african or black women uh who are sometimes uh uh, looked at at least by some of our uh racist uh white uh commentators here in the United States as uh nappy headed hoes uh but i i think that it could be construed as a uh, uh perhaps a, a form of disrespect for, for uh, towards uh black m- women but uh, it could, I'm sure you're right. Thought that I had, yes. and I, I'm, I'm, I, that's, I would I didn't think that think you're it right. Through enough, hmm. uh, just just kind of a just a, a different spin on on this uh, this conversation. We're 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 focusing on on uh, on the uh, symbol some symbolatry of 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 the, the untouchable white woman uh vis vis the the the, the re- having not be ha- the, the the black man not having a, the ability to have a relationship historically with the the uh uh lily white uh uh flower of 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 uh of of humanity that is the white woman that's always been the untouchable it's it's uh, full of a sort of dramatized prejudice. Also, the effect of the effect on the gorilla of contact with this young white lady is to make the gorilla a perfect gentleman. Uh, but it's <laughs> it's I an know extraordinary we can fantasy. A lot, <laughs> a lot of different ways. I, mm. I've, I've got a website, uh, discussrace. dot com, where I. I, and I've got a discussion forum. Right currently, we're always adding discussion threads. I've got about 350 now, and uh, I'm always trying to instigate uh, and agitate and uh, uh, encourage dialogue uh, among these subjects that have been uh, uh, historically uh, not talked about, and um, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully, I can encourage more people to uh, to talk about these things that we've not been talking about, and read and engage others, because that's the only way that we're going to uh, uh, to change the world. Yes, by en- encouraging people not to be afraid. I'm sure that's that's right, but it also seems to me. A terrific and wonderful moment that America has moved to the presidency of President Obama. Mm. 
I, I agree. I, I do agree, sir. Um, I also want to, to say that, um, and I don't want to be a, con, a conspiracy uh, th uh, theory proponent, but I, I do think that uh, President Obama was uh, something that had to happen. And I think that the powers that be uh, realized that uh, he was uh, coming up through the ranks at the right time, and this was something that needed to be fostered uh, in, in an attempt to begin some substantive healing uh, between uh, what whites empirically understand and, and, and of course, the black experience uh, – I think that he is, of course, he's got his hands very far into the pockets of people that do not have the black community's interest at heart, and I think that's the nature of the beast. Uh, and uh, but I think that he is a step in, uh, he is a necessary and needed step in the right direction. Um, I just don't know. I don't have the the knowledge. Uh, the inside knowledge to know if, uh, if he has got or is going to have the ability to substantively do some things for the black community that really have been so long and, and needing to happen. I don't know uh, if he's going to be able to do that. I hope so. But, uh, but I'm sure you're right to be uh, concerned and to a degree skeptical these things are very difficult and complicated and uh, I'm sure it, if, if he has given an impression that things can happen easily or quickly I, I think on the whole he's been careful not to do that but uh, I, I'm sure it, the, the work that he has will be very difficult and uh, he will have many uh, hands tagging at him to restrain and steer what he does, and it will be quite a difficult job. That, that, that was the uh, that's the understatement, sir. Um, mm. You know the, what he had to do, the dance and the walk that he had to to articulate in order to to get the nomination, and in order to beat McCain, which was kind of a joke. John McCain, Sarah Palin. I mean, who couldn't beat them? Well, uh, that uh, there was some kind of a race between them and uh, Barack Obama just uh, illustrates the, the degree of uh, our, our country's uh, uh, problem with electing a man of color to its highest office. So that being said, he was elected, but the dance that he had to dance, the the the, the 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 pushing away and the keeping at a pull, at, at an arm's length the the racial dis discussion uh and the articulation of 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 dealing with it and 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 and, and mollifying the the black community in a general sense and uh, uh also keeping the white community uh knowing that he was not going to be a racial person. He was going to, I mean, the white community historically has not wanted to deal with race. Uh, and if Barack Obama would have went there, he would have been shut down very, very quickly. And this is well known. I mean, this is not new. He knew that. He's not, he's a very intelligent man. And, and the people that he's sur he surrounded himself with are very intelligent. So he had to, to, to do a, a, a real quick step to keep uh, the white community on his side, and he did it. But I do think that the powers that be knew that he needed to be put in that spot uh, as the, the, the president, uh, uh, and this is what this country needed because he just came around along at the right time and was – it was probably uh, people knew for quite a while that he was going to be a man that could fill that particular uh, role and help uh, begin. Uh, and what I want to say is I don't know uh, 
what the, the what the end result is. I don't know if we the powers that be really want black people to be totally empowered in a sense that they have the same kind of standing as the white man in America. I don't know if that would be uh, in, in a perfect world. That's where we want to go, but I don't know if that's where the powers that be want to go. So I can't say uh, what uh, what they really want from Barack Obama, President Barack Obama. Do you follow me? I do follow you. Probably. Not. Um, I think. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. No, I, no, I do appreciate. I, I think Barack Obama is very adroit, and this means that he will manage. But a lot of people with a lot of hopes may very well be disappointed um, at the end of his regime by by the fact that not more has happened, which they wanted to happen. But at the same time, things will be better. That something will have happened, and that it may be that history will think that he that he did what what could be done at the time which was less than people hoped for but still was was something and better than if anyone else had been elected i, I hope that i don't know i mean obviously and i'm very much outside the situation obviously sitting here in england but i i hope it will look like that he does seem very he certainly seems very adroit and in so far as one can manage these hugely different desires which are sort of converging on him. Um, I can't imagine, I seem to, I can't imagine anyone, so far I've not been able to imagine anyone doing a better job of that. It seems to me an almost impossible job, but not totally impossible. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. I wanted to uh, hop in, um, yeah, because I told uh, Dr. Harvey, my program we were going to run for two hours and a little over now um a, a, a smidge um i again wanted to uh thank dr harvey um for coming in and uh sharing his time calling all the way from the area of the world known as england um to discuss his book men in black um very much appreciate you uh sharing with us today and uh thank everybody for calling and listening as well but i definitely appreciate you uh coming in to talk about your book I have learned quite a bit and uh, definitely plan on checking out the two books that uh, you shared to address uh, language. Uh, if you'd like to tell the listeners anything else, if you have any books uh, or any other projects that you're working on, uh, if you'd like to tell uh, the listeners, feel free. Well, actually, the publisher who did Men in Black has asked me to write a more general history of the color black. So. The question uh, in all its aspects and not just to do with clothes. So the question is a very live one uh, for me. So there will be a, another book on black in, in, in a year or two. Uh, I don't know exactly yet what it will be, what it will be called. But uh, if listeners do remember me when they see a new book come out on black and if, they, if the name John Harvey catches their attention, um, well, I'd be very pleased. <laughs> We will do that. I will definitely uh, make sure I keep my eyes open uh, for another work, uh, particularly if you're going to be talking about black and, and symbolism there. I will definitely uh, keep my eyes out for it. Uh, again, uh, Dr. John R. Harvey, author of Men in Black, our guest today. I want to thank you for calling in, and I uh, will definitely uh, be in touch. And, and thank you again for being so gracious with your time, sir. Thank you for asking me, Gus. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. It has been my pleasure, sir. Thank you so much, and I will uh, speak with you soon. Thank you. Um, I definitely uh, I wanted to. Uh, Mr. Williams, are you still here? Uh, Mr. Myers is. Yes, sir. I thought I had uh, Mr. Williams present as well. Oh, I boy, well, and I I wasn't able to catch uh, him. I wish I would have been able to hear more of what he had to say. Oh, I, I think I lost it. Mr. Williams. Okay. Um, my switchboard uh, gets a little funny uh, sometimes uh, yeah. at a certain point in the program. So I might have lost Mr. Williams. If I did, man, I uh, am sad about that. I did want to ask him a uh, few questions since I had him on the air. It's not often that I'm able to uh, converse with him directly. Um, I will, I'll make a plug for him since he's not here to do it himself. Uh, Mr. Edward Williams, 
uh, host of the Counter Dash Racism Network. Um, you can go there, uh, check out his site, counter racism counter dash racism dot com. Uh, you can check out his site. He has uh, tons of lectures from Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Uh, the cows is rebroadcast there. Um, lots of constructive information. He has a work study for people who are doing uh, experiments or projects of any sort that are uh, relative to racism, white supremacy. Uh, there's a dictionary there, dictionary where you can go. Uh, and they uh, discuss different words and definitions, a lot of what we talked about today, definitions of words, and uh, you can share ideas about different terms, what they mean, what the most accurate definitions uh, for a word would be. Uh, very constructive information. He recently even uploaded a video where the non-white male known as Tiger Woods uh, said in an interview, the strongest motivating factor for him has been being mistreated because he is not white. Uh, he was being interviewed, I believe this is on ESPN, but this is on uh, Mr. Williams' Counter Racism Network. Uh, he has a lot of other videos as well. Uh, as I said, radio programs, uh, audio clips, just lots of constructive information. Please go to uh, counter-racism.com, uh, Mr. Edward Williams' site. I wish uh, he had been able to hang uh, hang on. I don't know if I lost him or if he you know, got tied up and had things to do, but. I definitely thank him for calling in uh, to the program and appreciate his support uh, in uh, rebroadcasting my episodes uh, as well. Uh, C-R-E-E-7, uh, she is a non-white female uh, who is going to be coming up with her own counter-racism broadcast here on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, make sure you check her out. I believe she's shooting to do her first program uh, at the beginning of June. I believe it's June 7th, uh, I suspect. If you uh, put, if you do a search on Blog Talk Radio, if you put in counter racism, I suspect you will see her show pop up. It should be C R E E seven. That's a new host here at Blog Talk Radio. She'll be doing constructive work on racism, white supremacy. Definitely look out for that new show. I'm sure it will be uh, fabulous. I'll be checking it out. Um, Mr. Myers, uh, could you yes, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Tell them your, your website again so that we get that information. We can go there and support your site as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my website is uh, www.discussrace.com, one word, D-I-S-C-U-S-S-R-A-C-E dot com. And I've got a discussion forum on it that uh, there are a lot of really neat discussions that uh, are, would be uh, informative to read if you'd like. Outstanding. I, I hope everybody that's tuned in, uh, check out Mr. Meyer's site. Um, and I, I definitely want to have you back on the program to discuss more of what we uh, spoke about when you called in on Saturday when Dr. Moore uh, was on the yes. program. So, yes. So uh, I, oh, uh, what a great conversation. I, oh, I we thoroughly enjoyed So much more of that. <laughs> I've tried to uh, contact Dr. Moore since this past weekend. I know he's been out of town and all that good yeah. stuff, so I'm going to try and get in touch with Dr. Moore again, because other people uh, wanted me to see if I could get him back at some point to have him on the show. So I definitely, if you're listening, Dr. Moore, thank you for the show. Enjoyed it. It was fabulous dialogue. Uh, very much appreciated him taking his time. Um, I know coming up, uh, as soon as this broadcast ends, I'll be going to get to work. Uh, A.C. Thompson will be on the program this Friday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. A.C. Thompson is a white man, I believe, a journalist. He did an investigative report on black people being mistreated and killed in Katrina, or excuse me, in New Orleans during the whole uh, Katrina debacle where white men armed themselves, uh, went out uh, KKK style, and just decided that this was a good chance to go hunt down black people. And Mr. A.C. Thompson, uh, he went to New Orleans and did some very thorough investigating of what happened uh, around this incident, uh, reported on it. Even uh, some of his investigation revealed there was uh, some complicity with the New Orleans Police Department and them either allowing this, not doing anything about it, 
no effort to correct this behavior and to go out and see that justice was done. Uh, very uh, just disgusting aspects of racism, white supremacy, but his report stunning. Uh, if you Google A.C. Thompson and Katrina, I'm sure it will pop up. You can read uh, his reports, and he's done several uh, on the work that he did there. But he will be on the program Friday, 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. He'll be here to discuss his work on Monday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific and 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Mr. Tim Wise will be here. Tim Wise is furious with me because I reference him as an admitted white supremacist, which he said on my program. Uh, if you go to imeme.com and put in uh, Gus T. Renegade, I'm on imeme.com. That program is on I mean. That program has been in the rotation on the Counter Racism Network. He said it on my show. Um, he's very upset for a myriad of reasons. If you go to the code.net, uh, you can see the emails that he sent me, and they are voluminous. I mean, wow. He had a lot to say, and I hope we will have a business like and respectable discussion. On Monday, I look forward to having Mr. Tim Wise on the program. Why? And make sure you call in for that program. Make sure you call in. I suspect that will be an incredible dialogue. Mr. Tim Wise, the alleged anti-racist, will be here Monday. And next Wednesday at 11.30 a.m., 2.30 p.m., Bill Ayers will be here. Um, all of the controversy around whatever happened with he and uh, President Obama and President Obama being friends with a terrorist, uh, all that. Uh, and Mr. Ayers also has a book. Uh, the book is called Race Course Against White Supremacy. Uh, we'll be talking about the book. I'm sure someone will call in and ask about everything that happened during the presidential campaign with uh, Mr. Obama and Bill Ayers. But Bill Ayers will be here next Wednesday. So three shows next uh, seven days, Friday, Monday, and Wednesday. Uh, subscribe to the cows if you're listening directly at Blog Talk Radio. You can just click the uh, blue link in the description. You can subscribe, and that way you will be updated anytime uh, I do a show. You'll know about it in advance. Please favor the show. I very much appreciate that. Um, yeah, tell your friends if you think it's constructive. If you don't think it's constructive, invest your time and energy in something else that will be productive for you because we want to be efficient in solving problems, replacing white supremacy with justice. We do not want to be wasting time. If you don't think the cows is constructive, invest your time and energy elsewhere. Uh, so definitely, I will, I'm actually going to read now. I have to prepare for Friday's show and all that good stuff. Uh, thank you, everyone who tuned in to the broadcast. Thank you, Mr. Myers, for calling in again. Uh, again, I look forward to uh, getting you back on the program. And if you think it's constructive, tune in again, share with your friends. We will be checking you out, DiscussRace.com. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. That's, that's it. DiscussRace.com, Dave Myers' site. Check him out. Go there. Chat it up. Uh, we will be back Friday, uh, 5.30 p.m., Eastern Time, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, A.C. Thompson. Uh, this is Gus T. Renegade, The Context of White Supremacy. Please check the blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com. That Pulp Fiction counter-racist film review is going up soon. I've just been busy. I haven't been able to finish it, but it's uh, I need like a paragraph and it's done. So please check the blog, the uh, Pulp Fiction film review will be uploaded soon. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and supporting the cows. Uh, I doubt racism, white supremacy will be over by Friday, so I suspect I'll be back in two days. Thank you so much for listening. I will catch everybody soon. Be well.